Hello and in this PIC programming tutorial I'm going to be covering the SPI interface slave and master otherwise known as the serial peripheral interface. Now as you see I have two PICs over here. I am going to use the 18F4520 as the master device and that's as its usual connections and it has an FTDI USB to serial connected to it so that we can see what's going on inside it or have a way to display the data that's coming through on the desktop. Then we have a 18F45K50 that we are going to use as our slave device. And this is no external connections, I'm just going to program this one. We are using a 16 megahertz crystal on the 45K50 and then the rest is just the SPI connections. The first connection we go over is the chip select or otherwise known as a slave select pin. On a master device it doesn't matter which pin you use for it. The fact is just you need to have it as an output and pull it high and then when you want to select a slave device you pull it low. Now on the slave side you have a dedicated pin which is also either going to be chip select or slave select denoted by SS or like you can see up here as CS and again it just determines which device you are talking to. Then we have the SCK pin which is the clock. You have different turn notations for it CLK, S, uh, the SCK that's here and then SCL which mostly refers to I2C but it really doesn't matter. They're all, all the same notation. The clock pins of the master and slave are all connected together. Now here comes the bit of a tricky bit. The SDI pin of the master is connected to the SDO pin of the slave and then the slave's SDI pin is connected to the SDO pin of the master. Okay now let's get into how SPI works. I'm quickly just going to go over the basics of the SPI interface. There is actually no standard to this. It just has a few things that stay consistent across different types of serial interfaces you can get. Mainly it uses a minimum of three lines and I'm going to use the PIX pin naming. So it's SDO and SDI and then you have the SCK pin. Now the bare minimum you need is for SPI is just SDO and SCK but we are going to be transferring between two stages. So this will be on the master and SDO will go to the SDI of the slave in, in the direction the arrow is pointing and then SDI will receive data from the slave's SDO. Then SCK will clock the slave SCK pin. And this is the slave side and then we have the SS pin which goes in this direction to also the SS on the slave device. Now SS can be any pin you would like it to be on the master side and then something of interest is you can use any clock speed you like with SPI but the standard clock speeds are 1 megahertz to 10 megahertz but you can go as low as in the kilohertz range for your clock. I have seen interfaces that go to 300 megahertz plus. I believe there's also interfaces that go into the gigahertz range. Something on the SCK pin is you get different types of modes for SPI, which is mode 0 all the way to mode 3. Now each of these have a different configuration of how the CSK and the data lines are going to do but we are going to set that our idle clock is in high so at 5 volts and then our SDI pin here is going to be high impedance as well. So I believe this is mode 3. You can look that up. I am not sure but this is how I am going to configure it. Also the sampling is going to be in the center of the clock. Now a slave is selected by having a high line and then pulling it low during a transaction. And when your transaction is done and you don't want to talk to the slave anymore you release the pin to be high again. On the master side which is the 18F4520 we are going to look at the 
Master Synchronous Serial Port. Now, something interesting with this port is, if you remember from the ITC tutorial, which I have a link up in the corner for, the ITC has also uses this register. So if you're using SPI, you can't use ITC, technically. There are ways to get around it, but that's out of the scope of this video. So we are going to configure this as the serial peripheral interface. So we can see here, the SPI mode allows 8 bits synchronously transmitted and receive it simultaneously. Uh, all four modes of SPI are supported. This, that's the previous modes from 0 to 3 that I mentioned earlier. Then they list out uh, the pins we are going to use for the SPI, which are these three. And since we are using the master, we are not going to use the slave select pin. As this can say here, additionally a fourth pin may be used when in a slave mode of operation. And this is going to be the master, so we're not using it as the slave mode. Okay, and these are just the control registers. This is the internal function of the thing. It's not that important to understand it, but it's nice to have a reference of how the internal circuitry works and is connected. For SPI, we have three registers, which is SSP CON1, SSP STAT, and SSP BUFF. And these three registers are the ones we are able to interface with. And then we have SSP SR, which we can't access, but is accessed via SSP BUFF. This is the actual physical shift register that moves the data in and out of the SPI bus. Then we have the SSP stat register, which we only can read and write two of the bits on it, which is going to be the upper two bits, which is bit 7 and bit 6. And the rest are just read status bits that the PIC will set to tell us what's going on. In this case, we are going to set the SMP bit to zero so that we sample it in the middle of the clock frequency. We give the slave time to latch its output data. Then we have bit six with SPI clock select. We want to have it as a transmission from active to idle clock state. So it matches up with the SMP bit. This setting needs to match your slave as well. Then we go to the SSP CON1 register, which you'll see Bit 7 is our right collision bit. Now uh, this bit needs to be cleared when this appears. There's a sp specific interrupt for this, which we are going to use. So whenever this happens, we just write a zero to it. And this is the receive buffer overflow indicator. This uh, has the same interrupt associated with it as bit 7. And we are just going to clear that in the case it happens. Then we have bit 5, which is SS pin which is basically turning off the MSSP. So this is your on-off switch for your SPI or your I2C. We are first going to have this as zero, and then at the end of the configuration, we are going to set this as one. So it sets our pins, um, our peripheral interface pins. Then we have clock polarity set. This is also to do with the SPI mode. We are going to have it idle state of clock is level high. So whenever we're not transacting any data on the clock, the clock will sit at 5 volts and not at 0 volts. You take it to idle is low state, the clock when we're not transacting any data will be at 0 volts. Then we have bit 3 to 0, which is our SPI type select. Now we are going to select number 2, which is master mode and the clock frequency will be the oscillator divided by 64. Now I'm just taking the slowest possible option just to ensure that the data is transacted correctly and we don't need to do any error handling. It's also recommended that you run your slave device faster than your master device so that when you request data you can you have enough time to give it that requested data instead of running into these overflow bits and Stuff like that. Okay, then we have the operation, which can be read through. Let's have a look at the SSP buff. Now, the SSP buff, once it's written to, the contents of it gets put into the SS, SSP SR register, which basically pushes out the data on whichever line the data has to go out on, and it also receives the data that's coming in. So for master mode, to transmit data, we have to write to the SSP buff, then we wait for the received data and then we read the SSP buff again. 
and that's how we transfer data on the SPI line. This will make much more sense when I show it in code. Now SSP buff, they mentioned the BF flag. I literally do not use the BF flag for this. I only use the BF flag for uh, ITC transactions. I don't know why they mention it. I see also they use it in the assembler. I don't, absolutely don't use it. We're going to use interrupts to determine when our data has to be transferred. Then we have the enabling of the SPIO pins. This is not that important as long as your hardware is connected correctly. Then we have the diagram. We have SPI master where we have SDO as an output and SDI as an input. Then we have the SDI on the slave mode connected to SDO on the master and then SDO connected to SDI on the master from the slave device. Then we have the zero clock. Now the one thing they don't show here is the SS pin the SS pin will be connected here to the slave and then the master will have one of the pins select the slave. And we have some reading here. They say you can get up to 10 megabits if you have a 40 megahertz clock. I'm running at 8 megahertz divided by 64. So I'm not even going to calculate that since the clock doesn't really matter. So the master has full control over the clock. And here we have the different SPI modes on table 17. And as you can see, here's mode 0, here's mode 1, mode 2, and mode 3. And then we have the associated registers. Now, we need these three registers for our interrupts, which can be enabled here. And then one of the interrupts they do not mention, which is our right collision and overflow interrupt. Now, these interrupts I'm talking about, we are going to the interrupt section. And we are going to peripheral interrupt register 2 and it's located as BCLIF, which is bus collision interrupt flag. We are going to use this interrupt that if there is any communication problem, we need to clear this. Otherwise, the whole SPI bus terminates. It just doesn't work if you don't clear those uh, when that flag goes high and you don't clear the associated bits with those flags. Then we have PIE. And it's going to be in the second register. We are going to enable BCLIE for the bus collision. So we have to have that enabled. And then we have IPR, which is going to be in the second register. And we are going to set the priority as high. Okay, and that's basically the registers we have to go over. Okay, now for the code. We have our usual base setup with our TRIS registers low and our oscillator set to 8 MHz. We have our UART initialized and we have our UART receive. And then we have our interrupts. I just preset up the interrupt flags. So the overrun error flag is here and cleared. And the data received flag is here and clear as well and then we have a UART one which we are not going to use our uh, low priority interrupt is empty first thing we are going to do is define our pin directions so we say hash define i have them pre-made here so spi dir for the sdo then we define second one which is our clock pin uh, hash define and then we have SDI dir for that one, and then we have SPI dir CS, and these are going to be equivalent to the LAT registers. So for SDO, we are going to set the TRIS register of RC5. Then for CLK, we will use RC3 for TRIS C. SDI will be RC4 on TRIS C. The CS will be RE2 on TRIS E. And this can actually be any pin on the master device. Then we add our last define, which is going to be the SPI CS pin. And that is going to be let E uh, pin LE2. So this pin. So these two have to match each other. Then we are going to create a function void. And we say SPI master uh, init. We say void. Then we say SSP con 1 bits and we take the SSP and enable and we disable that bit so we turn off the serial peripheral interface and we say ad con 1 bits 
BCFG is equals to 0x 0f which will set uh, the analog pins to digital that we are going to use because some of them share analog properties we're just ensuring that they are in digital state then we take our definitions here let me say we just quickly copy them over and then sdo we set to be an output we set clk to be an output clock to be an output, SDI to be an input, and CS to be an output. Let me just reorder these so that they match up with my other code. Then we take our CS pin, our SPI CS pin, and we set that equals to high. That is to deselect the slave device. Then we go with the SSP stat register, SSP stat Let's and they say SMP equals to zero, like you can see in the data sheet at the bottom. And we take SSC bits again, uh, SSP stat bits, uh, and then we say CKE is equals to one. And then, then we go to the SSP uh, con one register, we take the bits, we say SKP is equals to 1 and the next one is in the SSP1 register we take SSPM and we set that to 0x02 to select it as master mode with the SPI clock being the oscillator frequency divided by 64 then we take our SSP enable bit and we say that is in the enabled state. Now we need to set up the interrupts, which is first we're going to have our um, bus error interrupts, which is going to be PIE2 bits BCL IE is equals to 1. Then we need to set IPR to bits B. I'll see uh, the priority to 1, uh, so it's a high priority interrupt, and then we go to IPE 1 bits, and we set the SSP IE to enable the data transfer interrupt, and then we have the IPR 1 bits, then we set SSP IP priority to be a high priority interrupt, and that's the initialization. Now we are quickly going to set up the interrupt for this. Now for when data is ready we are going to say vol a tile pool spi rx data ready is equals to false. Okay now we take this volatile bool we go down to our high priority interrupt and where we have our data ready which is ssp if but if that is high, we go and set this to true. And now we need to transfer data on the SPI bus. So the next function we need to write is our data transfer function. We start that by returning void. We say SPI write and we pass it in a uint 8 score T and we say that's our data in. So this is going to be the eight byte, uh, the eight bits we are going to send over the SPI in a single transaction and then uint 8 pointer to data out and that's going to be our data that we are going to receive now to send data over the SPI bus we use the SSP buff register and then we set that equal to our data in so that's the data we are going to send over the SPI bus and we simply say while SPI data ready is equivalent to false and then we just execute a nop now we receive our data is we read the SSP buff register. So we say data out, we use its uh, value and then set that equals to SSP buff. And that's how to complete a transfer in SPI. Something I forgot is SPI data ready needs to be set back to false after it has gone through in the SPI write function. The last function we are going to use on the master is another transfer function so that we can send more data on a single transaction. 
So make a function called void. We say SPI transfer. Uh, forgot the S. And we say uint 8 pointed to TX data. And then uint 16 TX size. And then we have uh, uint 8. Just move that in. Uh, to RX data and that will be a pointer and then we have uint 16 rx size and then we just declare a local variable of i actually let's make that a uint 16 and set that equals to zero and we use a for loop and we say i is equals to zero i less than tx size and i plus plus now, this is not the most wonderful function, but it works. And we take uh, SPI write, copy that over, and simply what we do is we take TX data, pass that in, and then we point to um, RX data of I, and we also have to point to TX data of I. And that gives us the ability to transfer multiple bytes on a single transaction. And another mistake, we don't need to reference the TX data. We can just pass it in as a straight variable since we're not using a pointer. Now we need to implement these functions. We take our SPI master init, go to our main loop, after UART init, add SPI master init. Then at the top, we declare two arrays, two uint8 arrays, and we say TX underscore data. And we make it an array of two elements, and we set that equals to zero. And then we just duplicate that. We have to add a T there, and just say Rx data. Now to initiate the transfer, we call SPI write, and we say TX data is sent over, and then size of I always forget that E uh, TX data, and then we duplicate this and replace TX with rx on the second set of parameters. Now this will initiate a transfer, but we need to select the CS pin to activate the slave device. So we say CS is equal, uh, SPI CS is equals to zero. And then after the transaction is done, we say SPI CS is equals to one to deselect the slave again. Hopefully the final correction, we need to use SPI transfer and not write in the main loop, but it's not very helpful if we just send zeros over the SPI line. So what I'm going to do is take TX data, it's zero with element, and set it equals to 0x8f. Now it doesn't really matter what value it is, it's more important on the slave side. I'm just using this for example purposes, and the next TX data slot will be zero. And then before every transaction, we say mem set. Let's take this below. And then we just add in zero. All this does is it quickly sets the entire array equal to zero so that we don't have miscellaneous data in our transactions and it clears after each transaction because we are going to infinitely loop this. Then we just add in a quick print, uh, which I pre prepped here. Now oh, I just need to alter this to fit with the code again because I originally wanted to use an LSM6 with this, but yeah, my LSM6 blew up. 3.3 uh, volt sensors and advertised to have level shifters on it, but yeah, didn't have level shifters on data input, so I blew the whole thing with uh, 5 volt signal level. So that's our master's code. I will program the pick. And now let's have a look at the 18F45K50's data sheet for its slave SPI. Now we have an 18F45K50's data sheet over here. It also has the MSSP module or Master Synchronous Serial Port module. It practically works the same as the 18F452's module, but we are going to set this one up in slave mode. So we're going to jump to the SPI my, I mode overview. So they're using the same ones and they just turned CS into SS, which is a slave select. So I am guessing this is intended to be a slave device. That's just a guess on my part. Now, most of this is not too, too important. 
I have a multi uh, multi motor. This is the standard method you would typically have your SPI devices connected. Then we have the same registers, uh, SSP STAT, SSP CON 1. Here's one of the different registers is SSP CON 3. We also use SSP BUFF and SSP ADD we also can use. And then we have SSP SR which is exactly the same usage. But uh, the SSP ADD is not important since we're using this in slave mode. And then the only major difference is that the SSP is followed by SSP1. The X implies that there's more than one M SSP module on the pick, but there is only one that I'm aware of since there are only a single set of output pins on this range of picks. But that might be different on under 18Fs in another range. And then we have a proper diagram, which is considerably better than the previous one. We are going to set this up as a SPI slave with SDI as input, SDO as output, SCK as input, and SS as input. Uh, then we're going to skip to slave mode. Then we have when the last bit is latched in SSP buff, uh, SSP IF interrupt flag is triggered. This is now as soon as you, as soon as your buffer fills up, it triggers an interrupt, and then you can read the data that you have received. Then also here, before enabling the ISP module, your clock line needs to match the proper idle state. So if you select your idle state as high, it has to be high. Otherwise, you are going going to get corrupted data. But that is what our error handling is for. And then we have this daisy chain, which is actually the first time I have ever seen this, using it as a shift register like this. Then we have a diagram that shows what happens if you pull up the slave select pin in the middle of a transfer. So basically all that happens is the shift register and bit counter is reset, so your BFF, um, your SSP buff register is not set with the new data in the shift register. If you pull it up before 8 bits are transferred on the line. And then you can see here how the interrupts function and how a normal transaction would be. Here is the proper diagram of a transaction of 8 bits with CKE equals to 0. The one we are interested in is this diagram. And you can go through it if you want to. The important bit is that the IF pin triggers over here. And then we have our pin selection here. Just something for Intersec, the digital or analog select works a bit different on a 45k. They have dedicated registers for each individual pin instead of a singular section of a register that sets the pins. So you have control over each pin if it is analog or digital on each port. And you can also see that they use SSP1 in this pick. If we had more than one, that this would be 0, 1, 2, 3, blah, blah, on. And then we have our interrupt registers for when data is ready. And they also do not list here how to handle a write collision. Okay, then they start with the I2C overview. But we want to have a look at the register. So we go to the SSP stat register. You can see in slave mode, this must be cleared. Then... We have the CKE bit, which must match our master. So if I just double check here, CKE equals 1. So we have to match that state. Then the rest of the bits we can are just read only, so we can't set them. Then we go to SSP 1 con 1, uh, which is the control register. We also have this exact one. We have our bit 7, which is our write collision bit. We have SSP, which is our receive overflow bit. Then we have our enable, and then our clock polarity bit must also match our master, and that will be a 1. And then we have multiple modes here, but the only mode we care about is if the highlighter would work with me, is this mode where we are in SPI slave mode and clock and CS pin are con control the CSK pin, SS pin control enabled. So this will put us in slave mode and the SS pin will be dedicated to the SPI interface. And they don't use SSP con 2 for SPI, so we can give that a skip. And we use SSP con 3, there's only bit 4, which is the override buffer enable. And we are going to set that to 0. 
So if a new byte is received with BF bit of the X status register already set, SSPOV bit of the SSP coin register is set and the buffer is not updated. So this just ensures that we don't corrupt our data. And then we set up interrupts exactly the same as what you would do on an 18F4520. The only difference is everything will be prefixed with a 1 in front of it. Okay, now let's get to the coding. Okay, now we have the 18F45K50's uh, code here. Just the basic setup is I have let B as all output 0. I have Tris RB7 and 6 as two outputs. I have the global interrupts enabled and then I'm just alternating toggling two LEDs on it. And then we have the interrupts, uh, high ISR and low ISR setup. And then we have the two interrupt flags handled here. And I need to set this one to zero to clear it. And those are the two interrupt flags. And then we can start with the SPI code. We'll say void SPI uh, slave init. And we give it void parameters. Now, the first thing we need to do is disable the SSP1Con, so we disable the SPI, so we say SSP1Con bits, I need to add a 1 again at that end, and then save it, and then we say SSPN enable is equals to 0, so we completely disable the port. Then we make sure all the pins we are going to use are in digital state, and then we say tris a bits ra5 is equals to an input so one that's our ss pin then we say trus b bits or b0 equals to one i'm only doing this because i am lazy and i don't want to create the defines for it i should actually be creating defines for this then the rest are all on the b port so we can copy this entire section and then paste it twice and we are going to have rb1 equal to a input and then rb3 equal to an output and rb1 will be our clk line our clock line sck if you if you're using the data sheets thing and then we have sdo so now we go to our stat register then we set uh, ssp1 stat bits and we set cke equal to one and we say ssp con one and one is and equals to three f and that's going to be an hex so we clear the upper two bits of the two error conditions that we can have then we use sspcon one one bits uh, ckp is equals to one so that we match our master devices uh, code and then we set the other bit which is going to be sspm equals to 0x04 we're using the slave mode that has the slave select pin in use then we set ssp1 con bits uh, con3 ben equals to 0 then we also said lastly ssp1 con smp i have the wrong register here i need to set this stat register bits smp equals to zero since that's required by the data sheet um it explicitly stated you can check it down there i believe it's in frame yes it is in frame you set that to zero then we're quickly going to set up the interrupts interrupts are almost exactly the same the only difference is the naming with the one over here we have those then lastly we take our ssp con and then we say that's equals to one to enable it and we take our spi slave in it just before the interrupts we just call it that will initialize it for us okay I forgot to do this in the master, but I should be doing this in the master as well. Uh, where we have a right collision interrupt, we can just quickly say that, and that will clear the errors for us. We're not going to handle the errors, we just don't care, we just dump the data straight away, we do not care. Then when we receive data, we do not actually care what we receive, but you may want to receive it for any whichever reason. Then you just say var equals zero. 
Now, this is actually where we receive the data. So, as soon as we trigger this interrupt, we know there is 8 bits in SSP1 buff on the slave. Now, to clear out the bits, we need to read the SSP1 buff. And I'm just going to do a dummy read here. I'm going to place the data in var and then say, let's say, if var is equivalent to what I set on the master as 0x8f, we are going to transmit be in hex and else we transmit ef in hex and just for interest sake if you look at the characters they spell beef and that's a transaction on the spi bus from the slave and then i just need to correct this on the master side i need to add in this error handling we just go down to the master's code and we go to uh, the interrupt and we just paste that code here and we remove the one there and then we should have a good and happy compiler. Now I'm going to quickly flash the two picks. Um, let me just run over what's going to ha or what how I'm going to demonstrate this. You see this print function. This is now in the master's code. You'll see what the master is transmitting and what the master is receiving back from the slave device. Okay, now unfortunately there's not too too much to see here, but you can see the one pick running. The other picks FTDI going bananas just for the USB to serial and um, basically you can see on screen the data that's coming through. Now let's have a look at the code. So sometimes you'll see an error up top. Um, I'll probably have one. Then the error gets handled by the interrupt handler. Now you can see that the order up top looks like it's reversed but it's actually not. You can see that it transmits BE on the second one and then EF on the first one. So basically what's happening is the master's transmitting 8F, we are receiving 8F here, and then we load the BE after we received a uh, BF, so it will be the second one, and then we receive zero, we drop the transaction, but the SSP buff still contains EF. So on the next transaction that we get, we first read the EF when the 8F comes through, and then we set the next transaction again to BE and you'll see that over there. And that's a basic introduction to using the SPI serial peripheral interface on a PIC microcontroller in slave and master mode. A like, share, comment and subscribe is always appreciated. Thank you. Have a nice day.